please be advised that this serving of AIDS, the Lost Voices, may cause offense or upset as we read newspaper articles from the 1980s and 90s that may include language and phrases that may be viewed outdated. Some articles and discussions may include brief references and descriptions to self-harm, death, post-mortem, and the odd uncontrollable swear word by me. I just can't help it. Anyhow, let's get on with the show. Oh, where did I put my copper? Do you fancy a stiff one after this? I beg your pardon? A stiff one. Mm, I think I'll pass, thanks. No, no. I, I mean a drink. Did you think? Ew, oh. you dirty. God, no. Oh, With oh, you? <laughs> no. You, Seriously. You do know you're saying this out loud. Before this descends into total chaos, shall we get on with the show? I think we better. Roll it. AIDS brings a response Fight from the government. AIDS, the disease which claims life. Welcome to Extra Tea with your camp host, William Hampson. And my fabulous car host, Gloria. And between us, we'll be looking back through the decades at how Britain reported on the AIDS pandemic. And where we will try to unpick individual stories in the newspaper archives from the 80s, 90s, and noughties. Ready. Ready. All right, let's do it. So last week, we delved into the British newspaper archives and how they covered the AIDS pandemic. While the odd article is slightly humorous today, much of the language and reporting was utterly well, jaw-dropping. Absolutely. How they got away with it is beyond mm, me. So let's get stuck in and kick right off with a story from 1986 brought to us by the Sunday Mirror. Now, the headline reads, Gay Plague is Blamed on Bugs, which is quite refreshing, really, and who knew bugs could be gay? Yeah, but they're still referring to it as the gay plague. Mm, exactly. So the article says... Insects may be helping to spread the gay plague AIDS, experts warned yesterday. A new report from the Centers for Diseases Control in the United States says there are 799 new cases of AIDS from unexplained origin. Regardless of their sexuality or preference, doesn't this perhaps highlight that these 799 people in 1986 have seen how others have been vilified in the press and society? And maybe they're too afraid to share or perhaps too afraid to speculate the origin of their diagnosis. Exactly. And this is why negative press on HIV AIDS can drive down people to even get tested given they are afraid of the stigma that has been created and we still see that today and the article goes on to say and the experts claim there are 22 studies where it is implied that viruses have been passed on by a variety of insects this has since been proven to not be the case is that correct oh yeah it is today i'm not too sure if in 1986 if if they knew i mean there's probably no dispute in that in the article where it says 22 studies have taken place and um, what does it say where it's implied that viruses have been passed on by a variety of insects but i think we get the gist of what the article is trying to do it's 1986 they don't specify what viruses and what insects it's a little bit unhelpful so to the reader then might start perhaps making a correlation between mosquitoes how they transfer viruses such as malaria how mosquitoes you know attack an individual it's still a question that is sometime asked today actually does hiv can hiv be transmitted by mosquitoes which it can't you can find the information online quite easily and if i just take a snippet from healthline.com from 2019 they say mosquitoes and other insects lack the receptor that hiv uses to recognize immune cells this means that mosquitoes can't get an hiv infection so if the mosquito and other insects can't be infected with hiv then therefore they can't pass it on to somebody else you know when they go and attack them as as famously as famously as they do but reading further down in the article actually is a response from a professor at middlesex hospital which actually might just answer the query that we had so the article goes on to say but leading british expert professor michael adler of london's middlesex hospital said it is nonsense as far as the unexplained cases are concerned the numbers have always remained constant and i think my interpretation of what he's saying is that breeding seasons of insects and that that you'd probably have perhaps at certain points of the, the the seasons or the year you would see kind of an influx of unexplained cases you know rising um through any kind of attack through insects so i think he's really just saying it's just all bullshit really yeah. which i think we could probably gather anyway okay moving on well just at the bottom of this article so remember it's january 1986 there's just another little piece by the same journalist states Britain's dentists are to be advised by letter to wear gloves, masks and goggles when treating AIDS patients following a special London conference of dentists and AIDS experts. So it's again, we talked about it in the last episode when we were referring to a case of Stuart thompson Neal in regards to pathologists and mortuary staff and the pathologists all coming together and saying that, that they should just wear the relevant PPE, which they'd been doing 
in previous decades in regards to other highly infectious diseases. So it's quite weird that in 1986 they're instructing dentists to wear gloves, masks and goggles when treating just specifically AIDS patients. Or how about wearing masks, gloves and goggles for every patient, especially as we don't know where their fingers have been? Mm, You'd have thought so, wouldn't you? Well, at least you would have hoped so. Anyhow, this leads me on to the next article. So we're moving out of the 80s and into the early 1990s, where on Sunday the 28th of November 1993, the same story broke in eight national newspapers. So the Observer being one ran with the headline, Scare After Dentist Dies of AIDS. The Sunday People wrote the headline, AIDS Alert After Gay Dentist Dies. And the Daily Express went with the headline, AIDS Alert for 10,000, with the strapline, Helpline is set up after homosexual dentist dies. While all eight have the same story, it was the Daily Express that condensed it slightly, and that's the one I'm going to refer to. But the other articles are all all available on the blog, um, so you can go check those out, because I do make reference to some of them. So it's the 29th of November, 1993, and the Daily Express with the headline, AIDS alert for 10,000, helpline is set up after homosexual dentist dies. They give us the lowdown, which is, a dentist whose death has sparked a major AIDS scare was a well-known homosexual. (laughs) Health officials set up a confidential helpline yesterday following the death of 43-year-old bachelor Vikram Advani. The Indian-born dentist ran two London surgeries in Camden and Kensington and had over 10,000 patients. He died last Monday of pneumonia, the most common cause of death in AIDS-related cases. Mr Advani's neighbour said he had suffered a dramatic loss in weight and was being counselled after his discovering he was HIV positive. And last night Mr Naresh Ghaffani, who bought the Camden practice earlier this year, said most of his patients knew he was gay. He was well known for his lifestyle and neighbours have told me that he was HIV positive. Camden and Islington Health Authority confirmed that the circumstances of Mr Advani's death were under investigation. General Manager Caroline Taylor said, We have had reports that one of our former dentists has died of AIDS, but we are still checking the facts. Mr Advani qualified from Cardiff Dental School in 1974 and was a general dentist, but he also had a reputation for private cosmetic dental surgery. He is believed to have given up his work last year. Camden and Islington Director of Public Health, Dr Mark McCarthy, said patients who had been treated by Mr Advani should ring the helpline on, and it gives an 0800 number, for advice. He's quoted as saying, The risk of transmission of the HIV virus from any healthcare worker to a patient during treatment is extremely remote. For 1993, this seems to be an incredible overreaction by the press. Oh, absolutely, you know, and this is two years just after Freddie Mercury passed away in 1991, so we saw the massive outpouring of grief for Freddie, which would perhaps indicate that if this could happen to, you know, somebody who was so loved across the world, but, you know, in British society, uh, itself their hero had died of AIDS you know you would expect that perhaps the stigma around HIV AIDS would just come down just ever so slightly hundreds of thousands turning up to the tribute concert for Freddie more celebrities coming out and doing a lot more work so you think that the stigma level not saying it would come down a lot but you know would just come down a little bit and you'd think that the newspaper or the media would read the mood of the public and it's just bizarre that in 1993 if there was a genuine concern to these patients that I don't understand why it was necessary to just bang on that he's homosexual to have it in the the strap line you're homosexual dentist what does it matter why does sexuality matter it's just a dentist he's just a dentist but it's just the perfect opportunity and it is just overkill like you say to vilify continue to vilify the gay community here we have a gay dentist they describe him as a bachelor so obviously he's single so that means he's had a life of promiscuity because he's gay and that's going to explain how he's got the gay plague or you know he's got the AIDS so that explains all that it's just an opportunity to just go full in on the gay community it also asks the question if there were 10,000 patients the local authority were going to be concerned about after learning that you know Mr Advani had passed away from AIDS then why would the newspaper want to just instill fear in those 10,000 people that really that they possibly could have contracted AIDS from this dentist and then the bigger question because it's in national newspapers that you're scaring the whole of the country that now are possibly now thinking shit should I go to the dentist or not because I might get AIDS so you know it just blows my mind yeah 
How they got away with it is beyond me. Mm, and me. So naturally, being a little bit nosy, I was intrigued to try and find out more about Vikram Advani. And there wasn't really much out there, but I was able to confirm that, as the newspapers had reported, he did die on the 22nd of November 1993 of an AIDS-related pneumonia. His estate, which included his Georgian townhouse behind Kensington Palace, so very swanky, was granted by probate at the value of just over half a million, which would be the equivalent of one million and fifty two thousand as of January twenty twenty four. In the Mirror newspaper in November nineteen ninety three, his neighbours did describe him as handsome, dapper, and extremely well-groomed. Definitely gay. (laughs) Bless him. So what came of this being splattered all over the press? Initially, nothing. Nothing? Well, not immediately. Not since that story broke in November 1993, where the helpline had been set up. It wasn't until 14 months later, on the 10th of January 1995, when the Evening Standard broke a story with the headline, AIDS alert for London's dentist, 1,300 patients. And the time between the story breaking in 1993 and this one in 1995 is explained in the article. A London dentist could have infected up to 1,300 patients with the AIDS virus after he deliberately flouted guidelines supposed to prevent such risks, it was revealed today. This morning, 1,285 patients of Vikram Advani were informed in a letter from health officials that they may have caught the HIV virus. Distressed patients were already calling a special helpline as soon as it opened at 8.30am, although the letter stressed that the chances of them becoming infected were extremely low. The case will raise new questions over whether controls on private dentistry are strict enough. Mr Advani stopped working in the NHS in 1991, but continued to practice privately from the surgery at his home in Dukes Lane, Kensington, until July 1993, five months after he had been told by a consultant that he had full-blown AIDS and should, on no account, continue working. John James, chief executive of the Kensington and Chelsea and Westminster District Health Authority, said today they had no knowledge that he had been working or that he had AIDS until his death. Mr. Advani, who was well known for his homosexual lifestyle according to other dentists, died at 43 of bronchopneumonia, the most common AIDS-related death in November 1993. The long delay in contacting his patients, 853 of whom live in the London area, was put down by Mr. James to careful detective work needed to trawl back through the patient records over the last five years. Of those contacted, 1,108 patients had been seen by Mr. Advani at his private address. Only 173 of them were seen on the NHS in the Camden and Islington area. So not the 10,000 that the Daily Express reported back in 1993. Well, I think it was a really good opportunity for the Daily Express in 1993 to state 10,000 because obviously it made a bigger headline or it would have been more attention grabbing because it runs the risk of, oh my God, of 10,000 people got AIDS. They've been infected by this one dentist. But they did allude in the article that it was across two surgeries Camden and Kensington so collectively it's more than likely that those two surgeries combined did have a total of 10,000 patients but I think anybody who's gone to a dentist in the UK I don't think I've ever come across a dentist that just works alone especially in London where Mr Advani was based and also as well was the reader able to themselves work out that if he wasn't at the Camden surgery was it likely that the Kensington Kensington surgery was closed or vice versa because you know he can't be in two places at once so it's highly likely that at each surgery there were other dentists working there as well so I can't imagine that 10,000 people were being directly treated by Mr Advani Ah. and so it'll come as no surprise when this story broke in the Evening Standard it was then within the following days picked up by the national newspapers and one of the first was the Daily Express with the headline AIDS hunt for 1,300 after gay dentist dies with the strapline Bachelor kept working when he knew it put lives in danger so Within the headline, we've got AIDS and gay. So that's telling us he's a gay man, he's got AIDS. And then in the strap line, you know, he's a bachelor, so he's single. So that's telling us straight away that he's gay, single, he's promiscuous. He has not tied down in a relationship. He hasn't got a partner. He's, you know, shagging about. That's how he's got the AIDS. So 
you're all in danger as well. Boom. Honestly, they make me sick. It is just weird. You know, what pleasure were they getting out of this? I, mean, I saw recently the documentary about George Michael. I think it was called Outed. There was a journalist that was from Fleet Street from some of these tabloids that were talking that was just saying that their offices were just full of of homophobia just filled with homophobia and it's just i think we see this in these articles you know during the aids pandemic but if you look at this article with many of the others there is a photograph of vikram advani and he clearly is like his neighbors said in the previous articles very dapper very handsome well groomed and very affluent and obviously he was very successful at what he was doing running two dentist surgeries and it's just when this story must have just landed on the the desk of the journalist they must have just been drooling it you know an opportunity to bring somebody down post death so they've they've passed away they've gone but still they must have just been drooling to just completely vilify and tear apart his reputation and desecrate the memory of his his friends and family it's just just makes no sense and it's just such a shame like under the photograph that looks just like a very nice photograph you've got the caption virus carrier no way and in this article with the daily express with the strapline bachelor kept working when he knew it put lives in danger goes on to say the death of a homosexual dentist sparked a nationwide aids alert involving 1300 patients yesterday all those at risk, including 67 children, will be offered free counselling and HIV tests. They face an agonising wait to discover if carrier Vikram Advani passed the deadly virus to them during treatment. And further down the article, it goes on to state, The authorities are contacting every patient Mr Advani treated from January 1988. Around 1,100 received letters yesterday. Hmm. Again, not the massive 10,000 they stated in 1993 when he died. But that's not the end because there's more. There's more? Yes, because even I recall back being a young teenager in the 90s that whenever a story that seemed to be a bit juicy ran, you could always guarantee that a couple of days later or the, the following week, the tabloids would manage to entice people out of the woodwork and they would do some kind of, you know, kiss and tell. With this story, it doesn't disappoint because they printed a two-page spread and they'd clearly thrown everything at it. So on the 13th of January, 1995, the Daily Mirror ran an exclusive, it's always an exclusive, of as we've discovered, with ex-lover of Advani, who was a doctor undertaking surgical procedures across many London hospitals. And the headline reads, We docs must be tested for AIDS, with the strapline, Gay lover of dead HIV dentist admits, I may have infected patients. Oh, here we go. I mean, the headline to me is a little bit weird and worrying, but let's have a, a read and see if we can work out what's going on. So the article says... The gay lover of a dentist who put 1,300 patients at risk before dying from AIDS dramatically urged compulsory HIV checks for medics yesterday. Dr. Keith Watts, who also has AIDS and has been given only weeks to live, admitted he could have infected patients while performing open surgery before he realised he was HIV positive. And he warned, there are lots more doctors and dentists like us out there. They may know or suspect they have AIDS, but they won't take tests and continue to practice. There must be regular screening because even if HIV positive medics stop working, they still could have infected someone unwittingly. Keith admitted that he and his Indian-born lover Vikram Advani, who died last year, shared an astonishing, promiscuous lifestyle. By day, they were respectable professional men treating scores of patients every week. By night, they dressed up in drag or kinky leather bondage gear. Then, with other professional men like lawyers, barristers and even police officers, they trawled London's gay clubs for bed partners and attended kinky parties. They were regulars at Western night spots like Madame Jojo's Drag Club, where Keith was offered a job and heaven. At other times, they would take exotic holidays together to the US and Caribbean. Their favourite haunt was a resort called Hedonism 2 in Jamaica, where they threw themselves into wild sex parties. Keith and 43-year-old Ivani's affair lasted two years, but in that time they each slept with scores of different men, some of whom they barely knew and sometimes having unprotected sex. Neither ever knew who infected them or whether they had infected each other. Chain smoking in the posh South Kensington Muse flat where paintings by his former lover adorned the walls, Keith, 40, said, 
The real kick for Vic was getting dressed up in drag. He enjoyed the front of being a dentist by day than doing all that at night. He loved it. Both men knew the risks and in February 1993, the bombshell dropped. Oh no. Avani had scores of wealthy clients revealed that he was HIV positive. He had stopped working at the NHS practice in Islington, North London, but aware of the risks involved, he continued to see his private patients. Keith, whose last job before being forced to give up work was at Charing Cross Hospital, said, I tried to get him to stop, but he wouldn't listen. He didn't want to know. I suppose I should have told the authorities, but we were best friends and it would have been a real betrayal. I don't think Vic was carrying on for the money because he was loaded. When you have AIDS, you become selfish. You don't think of anyone else. But he was going out of his mind with worry that he would be caught. If Ivani knew he was going to die, he went out in style, driving around London in a chauffeur-driven limo and blowing thousands on expensive antiques. Keith's new lover, 35-year-old antiques dealer Leslie Hearn, who knew Advani well, said, Vic thought nothing of blowing a quarter of a million at home. He really did have a jet-set lifestyle. He'd splash out on lavish meals and drank nothing but Bollinger champagne. He also spent thousands on makeup and clothes for himself because that's what he loved. He got gifts for everyone. Once, he bought 50 Mont Blanc pens and a big delivery of photocopy machines. We never found out where they went. He lived like there was no tomorrow because there was no tomorrow. It's the fine line between telling your story and advocating for doctors to ensure patient safety. Mm. But was it really necessary to go into all the details about Vikram Advani? You know, I think Dr. Watts' interview with the newspaper probably came from a really good place. It must have been awful to see his ex-lover and friend and somebody by his own quote in the, this article says that he was loyal to. It must have been awful to see all the things that were being written about him in the press, especially when he's dead, he can't answer for himself he can't speak up i think possibly this is what drove him to pick up the phone and ring the newspaper and say look actually let me let me tell you what my friend was like my ex-lover let me tell you what advani was was really like yeah. and really from the article because the quotes from dr watts are few and far between the rest is all filled in with by the journalist by the newspaper no doubt from conversations they had but it's all their interpretation of his word but to me it just sounds like that all he's saying is that he was a dentist by day. He had the, the means. He had the money. You know, he was quite well off to do what other professions were doing. And they mentioned lawyers, solicitors, lawyers, barristers, policemen were just blowing off steam at night. This is the, the 80s going into the 90s. So they're dragging up and going out to like Madame Jojo's, you know, which was a drag bar going down to heaven. For me, there's nothing out of the ordinary. Yeah, they're saying that they're, they're having um, various different sexual partners, but that went on then. We know that uh, it goes on today, you know, with apps like Grinder, No one bats an eyelid. So they're kind of just essentially just having a good time. I think I need to lie down. Well, hold that thought for a minute because it's not quite over yet. While this story broke, and it also broke on London radio, a couple of days later, the People newspaper didn't do a one or two page spread. They dedicated wait for it, an entire four pages to this story. And, as you can imagine, there are headlines and strap lines all over the place, and these are just some of them that hit you with each turn of the page. The perverted world of the dead dentist and the dying doctor. By day they mix with a polo set, by night they slid into the sleazy world of tight-fitting rubber and gay sex orgies. Scandal of the doctors who keep their deadly secret, page four and five. There are 30 doctors in England with AIDS and have not told their bosses. Perverted world. Looking at the pictures, it just looks like they were two gay guys living life extravagantly and enjoying it. And why not? Yeah, and I mean, obviously we know that they had the means to, to be extravagant. We look forward to, you know, a Thursday, Friday night or a weekend just to go out and get absolutely twatted. And it just looks like this is all these two guys are guilty of doing. Going out, blowing off steam, having a good time, and essentially not hurting anybody. And they're being vilified for it, being called perverts and sleazy, and oh, and it's just so Does sad. Does that picture say pervert? Where? Ah, oh, yes. Um, the caption under the photograph of Advani, who seems to be ever dressed in PVC or, or black rubber, and he's got his eyes closed, his mouth open, and his tongue sticking out. So if you can imagine somebody chucking a Malteser and, you know, trying to catch it in your mouth. It's, it's a, um, but it says, pervert, advani in party mood. Now, this picture's been cropped. 
clearly. So maybe it's been cropped because it wasn't publishable. It's unlikely that Dr. Watts would hand over compromising or explicit pictures to a newspaper. But maybe it's been cropped deliberately to give the impression that, as they call him a pervert, there's something perverted going on. I suppose we'll never know. That's what I was saying. So to give you a taster of this four-page spread in The Sunday People, which is, again, available on the blog, link in the show notes, so you can read it all yourself. I'm not going to read it all. So just to give you a taster, this is how it kicks off. The perverted double life that a dead AIDS dentist and doctor now dying of the disease kept hidden from their patients can now be fully exposed by the people. (laughs) Will. No way. Oh, absolutely way. And it goes on to say, Dentist Vikram Advani and Dr. Keith Watts, who were both practicing Freemasons as well as lovers, rubbed shoulders with royalty and moved effortlessly through high society. The couple were regularly spotted at posh polo matches, chatting to Prince Charles, the Duke of Edinburgh and Fergus' father, Major Ronald Ferguson. And they attended a sex and drinks party at AIDS-stricken Kenny Everett's London home. Dentist Advani included gay pop star Jimmy Somerville and raunchy novelist Molly Parkin on his gilt-edged client list. He was also a friend to dress designer Bruce Oldfield and Hollywood star Stephanie Powers. So that's how the article kicks off. Uh, A little bit further down, they continue. They dressed in tight-fitting rubber, leather and stockings, teetered around on stiletto heels and flirted with AIDS at wild sex parties at top hotels and luxury mansions. And flirted with AIDS at wild sex parties? Are they serious? Mm, It's just a weird choice of language, isn't it? And flirted with AIDS at wild sex parties. It's just... It's just weird language to use, but it's kind of, it's a very clever way in influencing the reader that's reading it in stoking up the fear and stigma that this is what, this is what happens. If you live this immoral lifestyle, then, you know, you're kind of dancing with the devil, so to speak. So just like the Dr. Watts interview in the previous paper, in this four-page spread, there's also another voice giving more of an insight into what life with Advani was like. Um, this is a woman who's been friends with Advani for 12 years, and in the article she's just referred to as a friend. She says, I used to go to fetish parties with Vic and Keith and their gay crowd. I used to take along my own boyfriend just for a laugh, but I was probably Vic's closest straight pal. We all used to dress up in outrageous gear. Vic and Keith loved to dress in the sexiest feminine gear they could find. Then we'd go off to secret venues where fetish clubs held their bashes. Some of them were outrageous and you'd get everything from bank clerks to brain surgeons dressed in rubberware and women's red knickers. I thought it was a scream. Living life and enjoying it. Exactly. And, you know, I think just as she describes it, they're literally just going out and having a fucking good time. They're having a scream, as she said. They're just enjoying themselves, living life to the full. They're getting the most outrageous costumes possible, you know, which from the photographs just look like they're rubber and PVC. It's not like they're going out with next to nothing on. And what gay man with his lover, takes along his straight girlfriend, you know, his straight female friend, sometimes with her boyfriend in tow as well, all dressed up to these to these parties if they're just going to be these sordid, steamy orgies. That's an interesting point. It's not necessarily always about sleaze and sex. Yeah. But I think back in 1995, when this was published, this would have probably made a few <laughs> few old biddies <laughs> run, run for the holy water. But um, I don't think it's as the papers are portraying it, really. And this article goes on to say, The stylish Indian-born practitioner, whose name is listed in Debrett's Guide to Top People, seemed an established pillar of society. He became a personal friend of Indian royalty, including the fabulously wealthy Raj Mathur of Jaipur, with Dr. Watts by his side, the secret drag queen mixed with Charles and Diana at polo matches, rock star Jimmy Somerville, well known as a gay rights campaigner, was a patient as well as a friend. Ooh, Jimmy Somerville? Yes, the Jimmy Somerville, and I reached out to Jimmy Somerville's management to see if Jimmy could share any insight into Advani and what he was like as a as a practitioner or friend, but there has been no responses yet. And, you know, despite the article telling us that he's listed in Debrett's and he's got all these royal connections and celebrity clients and friends, the article goes on to say, There was no hint of their nocturnal perversions and their life at the heart of a depraved gay circle. Advani's sordid double life even invaded his upmarket practice where he posed for pictures dressed in leather gear, stockings in the dental chair where he treated his upper crust patients. Oh, not again. I know. 
And me being a fellow gay, especially with the uh, gay plague, I'm, you know, I'm so offended. Then the remainder of the article goes on to talk about Dr. Watts, who obviously we know was connected to Advani because he was his ex-lover. In the article, he's talking about his own AIDS diagnosis. And I think because there's fresh quotes from Dr. Watts and there's additional photographs, some of them, you know, kind of similar to the ones that we saw in the in the Daily Mirror. I think in 1995, the peop- the Sunday People was a sister newspaper of the Mirror. So I think they did the one interview and then they just saved this for this publication to just be able to kind of sensationalise the whole story and drag it out a little bit ah. more. However, the article continues. Last night, a gaunt Dr. Watts, who smokes cannabis to ease agony of his final days, said that he was devastated when he was diagnosed HIV positive, but he carried on working because he was broke and had no other form of income. He said... I felt I was at least some benefit to others. It cost a lot of money to train me, and I knew if I was careful, I would not spread AIDS. I was desperate and in shock, and I didn't know what to do. There was no procedure for doctors at the time. I was afraid of a witch hunt. I was frightened my colleagues wouldn't understand and would ostracise me, but in the end, it didn't matter. At no point did I believe I put anyone at risk. And it's probably at this point on when Dr. Watts possibly did what most people did in the 90s when they spoke to the tabloid press and got a copy of the newspaper. They rolled their eyes and said, oh, that's not what I said. They've twisted that. It's not quite what I meant. Because the article goes on to state, Despite his claims, the people can reveal that Dr. Watts openly worked on surgery wards at Whittington Hospital, North London, on two occasions last year when he already had full-blown AIDS. In fact, he only qualified as a doctor on the 7th of January 1993 when he knew he had the full-blown disease. Oh, dear. And I suspect that the interview with Dr. Watts, they were all probably nicey-nicey. Yeah, we'll do a really nice article. And then when they've left with all the info that they've got from the quotes and the photographs, they've then gone behind his back to do a little bit of investigative journalism, which probably just shows why you should never trust a journalist. It goes on to say... When the people approached the hospital Dr. Watts had worked at, in some cases performing surgical procedures, they stated the risk of transmission was incredibly low. In late 1992, Watts, then training to become admitted in St. Mary's Hospital Paddington, after developing a form of TB which is known to be AIDS-related, he checked in under the false name of Keith Webber. It is known that at AIDS units in London, patients do sometimes use assumed names. So see now, the, the the journalists of the newspaper have really done some, some digging. So how did they know Keith Weber was actually Keith Watts? Maybe they found out from his birth certificate because his mother's maiden name was Weber. I see. But how do you know his mother's maiden name was Weber? Because it's on his birth certificate. I mean, if you're going to give an assumed name, then I'd have perhaps stretched my imagination a little further and not used my mother's maiden name. H- hang on, hang on. Why do you have his birth certificate? <laughs> Bitch, I'm nothing but furrow. I'm trying to find out more about these individuals. And um, yeah, I've got his birth certificate. So do you want to know what happened next to Dr. Watts? Or has all my <laughs> research been a waste of time? Read on. Okay, so Dr. Keith Charles Watts, once assumed Keith Weber, as we've just established, was born in December 1964. And they say life begins at 40, but sadly not, because three months after this final interview, on the 17th of April 1995, aged 40 years old, Dr. Keith Charles Watts sadly passed away as a result of AIDS-related complications. I wasn't able to find any burial or cremation record, although probate was granted, um, although it wasn't exceeding £125,000 back in 1995. I have been unable to find any trace of his then partner, antique dealer Leslie Hearn, to perhaps find out a little bit more about Dr. Watts and Advani, but to a degree... I think on picking the articles, they were just two guys that were just having a ball. Finished? Yep, that's it from me. Well, that's quite a lot to unpack. Well, it's for for each individual to perhaps unpick the articles and, you know, take away from it what, what they will. But I think from my perspective as a, as a gay man in London, not far off the edge of what, uh, Vikram Advani was when he passed away, living with HIV, but, and although I know, um, you know, with a different outlook on life, and I clearly don't have 
his means. For me, he's just very handsome, clearly looks like a, a charming and charismatic individual, somebody who is you know, hell-bent on just enjoying life, having a good time, and why not? He was very successful. He's obviously very good at his job to have the client list that the articles claimed that he did and the people that he was mixing with, the, the uh, really nice house, at the back of Kensington Palace on, on Duke's Lane in Kensington. You know, he's obviously doing very well for himself. And why not have a good time? And I think we all know that the great British media don't like successful people and will look to, you know, bring them down any way they can. And I think this almost for them must have been a double whammy. You know, I mean, they must have been frothing at the mouth that they've got this, you know, very handsome, charming, successful businessman. And on top of that, he's gay. And he's passed away from AIDS. So it's like, boom, they've got double the story. I just think it's a great shame that they just chose to totally vilify and stigmatise a man that had passed away, that couldn't speak up for himself. And I think it's great, actually, that there was attempts made by Dr. Watts to speak up on behalf of Advani and perhaps set the record straight. And that his friend also, you know, the, the female friend that she spoke up as well to try and set the record straight as to what Advani's life was like. And like she said, it just sounded like an absolute scream. Absolutely. And that didn't give the British press carte blanche to vilify Advani or Watts for their lifestyle choices or sexuality, of which were completely separate to their AIDS-related deaths. As the press knew then, HIV AIDS does not discriminate on the grounds of sexuality. The only thing that made me smile from reading all that is that Advani clearly loved life, was intent on having a good time, yeah. had a good time, you know, living with this killer disease. It was a death sentence and he'd lived his life to the full and it sounded like he went out living his life to the full. Yeah. What's the next story? Okay, so hopefully this final set of newspaper articles will be a little bit more uplifting because on the 19th of January, 1987, the Daily Mirror ran with the headline, AIDS, the Sister of Mercy. A 26-year-old nurse will don her dark blue sister's uniform and her crisp white starched cap and step into the front line of the war against AIDS. Jackie Elliott is in charge of Britain's first purpose-built ward for AIDS victims. Her first patients arrive today. The government has spent £350,000 converting an old female surgical ward at London's Middlesex Hospital to cater for sufferers from the killer virus. Broderick Ward was closed last year because of health service cash cuts, but the AIDS crisis has forced ministers to think again. Extra money has been found to turn the 12-bed ward into an immaculate and streamlined unit, made cheerful by its new green and cream paint, bright curtains, and by its young sister and her team of 15 equally young nurses. Despite the deadly nature of the disease, Jackie is determined to make the ward as friendly as possible. This is no place for masks, gowns, and other protective clothing. We will take the same precautions as with any other patients, precautions we are trained to take with everyone, she says. If you are clinically skilled, then you are safe. We will wear gloves if we are dealing with spilt blood and body fluids, and we will be as careful as always not to prick ourselves with needles. Protective clothing isn't necessary. Patients will not be kept in isolation unless they are very ill and need it for their own protection. I applied for the job because it is a terrific challenge. A nurse doesn't get the chance to set up and run her own ward more than once in a lifetime. I am nothing special. I am just doing a job and getting on with my life. I want to prove what a good job nurses are doing and this is the one way I can do it. Jackie hasn't had time to worry about her much publicised meeting with Princess Diana when she officially opens the ward in April. Jackie goes on to say, My biggest worry at the moment is getting everything ready for my patients. They are my first priority now and always. She's like a breath of fresh air. She said she was up for the challenge, but... Mm. And, you know, I think she must have faced many challenges there, mm. but from what I can see that she didn't falter in taking on those challenges head on and advocating for the rights and dignity of AIDS patients, especially those under her care at the Broderip, because a month after opening, she did respond to a story that made it into the People on Sunday on the 15th of March 1987, who went with the headline... AIDS victim sent 300 miles in bag, and the article reads, An AIDS sufferer was ferried 300 miles for treatment inside a plastic bag used to carry corpses. Only two slits were cut into the body bag. They provided eye holes for the patient on the horror journey from Ireland to a London hospital. The victim's cruel ordeal was revealed by nursing sister Jackie Elliott, who runs Britain's first AIDS ward. That is horrendous. Do you know, it's just, it's incredibly sad. It's, it's unbelievable. 
If I hadn't seen this story in print, I'd find it hard to believe that ever happened. Mm, I know. I know many of these articles are sad and depressing, but, you know, these are first-hand accounts. This this happened. But luckily in this case, Ward's sister, Jackie Elliott, was there and she responds. Disgusted Jackie said, It is just another of those horrific stories one discovers when looking into how insensitive we can be to aid sufferers. Jackie, 28, heads a team of 14 nurses in the £350,000 Broderick Ward at London's Middlesex Hospital. Staff on her 12-bed ward do not wear masks, gowns or other protective clothing. That underlines how horrific it must have been for a sufferer to be transported in a cadaver bag for that distance, Jackie said. She also revealed dramatic differences in the way London councils handle AIDS cases. Many are very good, but others aren't, she said. Oh, horrendous. You can't imagine what that individual must have gone through, but I think the only thing you can take away from this article is the fact that Jackie was there on the other end. They would have been made to feel comfortable and and cared for. And from some of the accounts I've heard from the Broderick Ward, even in many cases, you know, loved. You may have noticed that from that 1987 article, there was no mention of the gay plague or any of their other usual buzzwords, you know, such as homosexual or carrier or or pervert. Any of the terms that we've come to learn are constantly pushed in the press. But fear not, because at the end of the article, in the same frame as a side article, this newspaper just couldn't resist. And they shared this story. In Los Angeles, an AIDS victim was jailed for 10 years for raping a three-year-old girl. The court heard that 35-year-old rapist had adopted the child illegally in Ecuador. Doctors said he is likely to die within a few years. The child victim has not contracted AIDS. Such nasty bastards. How are these two stories even remotely connected? Well, they're not other. There's absolutely there's no connection whatsoever. But it's just to kind of draw the reader's focus back. That let's let's not that's 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 a sad story but let's not just forget that people with living with hiv aids don't deserve our sympathy because this is the kind of behavior that they usually conduct so i think that was the intent and purpose of sharing that story that is sad very sad but i think if if it needed to be reported on i mean it's not in it's not in england it's not in the uk it's it's from it's from america it's from los angeles surely that could have waited for the following day or the day prior if it needed to be reported at all or maybe they could have just left it for a um you know for an american paper to cover i don't think what i can't see you know how news newsworthy that would be over over here in the uk but to stick it in the same article you know into in the same section as that story it wasn't even in a box by itself it was literally just written under the text of of the article I've just read out and it's uploaded on the blog for people if they want to to see it but you know it's just fucking disgusting what a sad story the following month on the 9th of April 1987 Princess Diana opened the ward by unveiling a plaque and famously shaking the hands of an AIDS patient without gloves the Broderick ward of the Middlesex hospital is the only specially designed AIDS ward in Britain today the hospital reckoned that the princess's visit was worth all the government propaganda put together She met the staff and the nine patients and shook hands with them all. But for the duration of the visit, the patients moved from their usual beds to side rooms because they refused to be filmed or interviewed. Only this patient agreed to a still photograph with the princess and then only with his back to the camera. And whenever HIV or AIDS is mentioned in the UK, whether it's in a news section or in a documentary, generally that image will flash up, you know, in a montage or it'll be spoken about. And this also included actually um, in the newspaper, it also included a picture of the princess shaking hands with one of the nurses on the Broderick Ward by the name of Shane Snape. Nurse Shane Snape, an AIDS virus carrier himself, spoke at length to the princess. She said it must be really difficult. I said the hardest part about it was the way the media portrayed HIV and AIDS and trying to get the message across that somebody with HIV is infectious and not contagious. And how would you get that message across? You as well, a... I think the princess actually helped get that message across by the mere fact that she wasn't wearing gloves and the mere fact that she shook hands with the patients and myself. Has that made you feel better about the whole thing at the moment? Well, certainly in the respect that um, the lead up to Princess Diana coming was will she or won't she wear gloves? And she didn't. I mean, I believe she wouldn't and she's lived up to what I, I believe. She knew the facts. 
I don't routinely tell all the patients I'm HIV. I don't think I have the right to actually burden them with it. Um, but certainly there will come a time sooner or later where they will say the magic words you don't understand. And that's when I can say you're assuming a hell of a lot. I too am positive. But sadly, the hospital closed in 2005 and was demolished in 2007 with only the Grade 2 listed chapel still remaining. There are several accounts of the recollections from the nurses and doctors who worked on the ward, along with photographer Gideon Mendel, who took a series of photographs documenting life on the ward in 1993, capturing individual patients and their loved ones. And ward sister Jackie? As for sister ward Jackie Elliott from the Broderick Ward, I couldn't find Jackie to be able to reach out to her to see if she would come and tell us a little bit more what life was like on the Broderick Ward. So if you're listening to this, senior sister Jackie, then please drop me a line, get in touch. We'd like to hear from you to find out what life was like on the Broderick Ward and the amazing work you and your team did. If you've enjoyed listening to Two Bitter Old Queens, then don't be a shady bitch and show us some love with... A big fat like. A comment. A share. As in the link, not as in, do you believe in life after love? Oh. And for fuck's sake, don't forget to... Subscribe and follow. Follow.